Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Lucas. I'm here with the ODOT Research Department. We are getting ready to go ahead and start the results presentation today. Um, the project is for the evaluation of grade crossing hazard ranking models. Um, this was done through Ohio University, and our PI on the project was Ben Ferry. Um, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and have him do the presentation. Um, for everybody online, there's a chat pod that should have popped up with your GoToMeeting. There's, questions, there's like a chat pod down to the side of that. Um, you can type in any questions and we'll save them for the end um, after everything's done. If you have anything major, you can go ahead and message me privately through the chat pod. Otherwise, I'll let Ben take it over. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Michelle. And good afternoon to everybody uh, here in the room as well as out uh, on the computer. Uh, I'm with Ohio University and uh, as we get our title, Evaluation of Grade Crossing Hazard Ranking Model. Uh, before we get into the findings, I do want to uh, introduce the rest of the people on the team as well as acknowledge the uh, contributions of many people uh, who made this project a success. I am, of course, the principal investigator. Uh, Dr. Bob and Knight, another professor in our Department of Civil Engineering, assisted on this project, and then we actually uh, subcontracted uh, with Mr. Jeff Warner of the Texas A&M Transportation Institute, who provided uh, some valuable assistance uh, with his experience dealing with highway rail grade crossings. Our uh, technical liaisons from the Ohio Rail Development Commission, Tom Burns and uh, Lou Genazzo, are here in the room and uh, Kathy Stout as well. I appreciate all of their efforts. Uh, Kelly Nye, liaison from Statewide Planning and Research, could not be here today. I want to acknowledge also uh, Mr. Jim Dahlen from the FHWA helped us out tremendously. Uh, the Rail Commission and the Public Utilities Commission uh, staff who provided insight and assistance as well, and all the people uh, who work at other public agencies around the country that provided their insight uh, through the, in, the interviews that we conduct as part of this project. So we really appreciate everybody's uh, support and participation on this really very interesting project. So here's our outline. We'll, we'll talk briefly about the research problem, uh, goal and objectives. Uh, we will dive in on the research approach and we'll spend hopefully most of our time on the research findings recommendations and our uh, strategy for implementation. Lots of time, of course, for questions and discussion, which is the best part of uh, this presentation. So for some brief background about highway railroad grade crossings, we have in the state of Ohio more than 5,760 uh, ag-grade railroad highway cr uh, crossings. This is actually the fourth highest uh, number uh, in the U.S. Uh, so we do have a lot of grade crossings, a lot of uh, railroads, we have more than 5,300 of active rail lines, and 36 operating freight railroads. Now approximately one-third of our crossings, about 1,950, have what are called passive warning devices, for those of you who are unfamiliar. Uh, as shown here on the right side of the screen, have the railroad crossing uh, cross buck sign, and in some locations supplemented with a stop or yield sign attached to the pole. Uh, so there's no active warning, like a light. Uh, flashing lights or uh, highway gates uh, at approximately one-third of crossings in the state. Now, uh, way back in the mid-1970s, when great crossing safety was a significantly greater issue than it is today, uh, the FHWA launched a funding program that provided uh, federal funding for uh, warning device improvement projects at passive locations, so the installation of lights and gates at hazardous locations. This is known as the Section 130 program, uh, named after the portion of the U.S. Code that uh, allows it to exist. Uh, now, in general, the Section 130 program uh, over the last few decades has been effective at improving grade crossing safety. So we have the Section 130 program. Now, in Ohio, we have two main agencies that are responsible for grade crossing safety. First, we have the ORDC, or the Ohio Rail Development Commission. Uh, and this, uh, the ORDC administers Section 130 program funds on behalf of ODOT. Uh, it does a lot of uh, other initiatives and coordinates other safety initiatives, so specifically related to grade crossing <coughs> safety. Uh, they are the uh, responsible for the Section 130 funds as well as 
uh, funds made available by the legislature for uh, grade crossing states. We also have the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, PUCO. Their responsibility is regulatory oversight for grade crossing, annual inspection, and uh, very important for this project, maintaining the Highway Road grade crossing inventory database, an extensive database of information about all of the grade crossings uh, in the state. Now, due to the investments uh, by the ORDC and the PUCO, we have improved uh, in the state of Ohio. So between, for example, here between 2005 and 2010, we had an average of 110 crashes <coughs> per year uh, at grade cross. But in the most recent five-year period, so between 10 and 15, we've dropped that average then to 67 crashes per year. So we have made improvements, targeted investments, in uh, locations where we feel are uh, most hazardous for uh, grade crossing crashes. Now over the last five years we've seen then that approximately one-third of crashes are at passive grade crossing locations. And in these locations that have had a crash uh, in the last five years, generally speaking, higher train volumes, faster trains, uh, in most cases more and more tracks, as well as a higher uh, highway traffic volume than the statewide average for all across. So what are we really uh, getting at with that? And so if we have more trains and more highway traffic, the risk for a collision increases. So in the uh, safety, uh, in the grade crossing safety area, this is called closure. So it's the highway traffic multiplied by the train traffic uh, at a particular location. So on an average day, there's about 13.9 million highway vehicles going across a grade crossing in the state of Ohio, and about 77,300 trains going across the highway at a grade crossing. But about 95% of the exposure uh, is at locations that already have uh, active warning devices, so highway lights and gates. And yet, uh, one third of crashes continue to be at passive locations. So the distribution of crashes is not the same as the distribution of expected risk. So our continued focus investing in passive crossings is justified. So we'll talk about uh, briefly then the warning device project development process. So each year uh, our annual process starts with the development of a list of candidate grade crossing locations. This list originates with the PUCO uh, and the list is presented to the ORDC with the ranking established based on the existing hazard ranking model that's used here in Ohio which we'll discuss on the next slide. Uh, so the initial list is used to identify approximately 40 uh, candidate locations for a warning device project in, in a particular cycle. And of course, existing projects and some other factors are taken into account when getting uh, that initial list developed. So uh, ORDC then takes that list, uh, does a little bit more review, uh, and then we move on to the next step of the process, which is called the diagnostic review. This is a very interesting part of the process. We have a multidisciplinary team consisting of staff from ORDC, uh, railroad representatives, as well as representatives from a local highway agency. Uh, and from this group, uh, a determination is made based on that site visit whether or not we can implement a light and gate project at that location. So the so the diagnostic review team must have consensus on whether or not it is a good idea uh, to implement a project at that location. And then the ORDC staff manages programming of the project and the implementation, uh, including inspection and things like that. Uh, so a typical project is approximately 250,000. And in each funding cycle, we have about 20 to 30 projects. Now, if there are funds remaining, there are two cycles in each fiscal year, each state fiscal year. And of course, uh, once a project is completed, the inventory database is updated for that location. Now, uh, what we really have in this project is we are investigating uh, the models that are used to generate that initial hazard ranking of crossings. So currently, ORDC and PUCO use a model known as the USDOT Accident Prediction Model as part of that initial uh, list that is generated of potential locations for an active uh, warning device project. Now, some background on the accident prediction model. So it's a multi-stage model. So we start by predicting the uh, 
annual frequency of crashes. So it's a crash prediction model. Uh, so you estimate the number of crashes per year at that location. You make an adjustment to reflect uh, potential crash history. So if there is a crash in the last five years, that would be uh, put into the calculation as well. And then there's a small adjustment factor at the end of the, of the calculation uh, to update based on national uh, grade crossing safety trends. Now there's another component not used in Ohio that would then estimate the probability of a crash being a fatality or injury uh, given that a crash is occurring. That's not currently used in Ohio. Now the statistical coefficients are based on national averages. Uh, so things that the trends and things like that from the U.S. as a whole are reflected in uh, the U.S. model. Uh, and then based on the estimated crash frequency, uh, we then establish here in Ohio the hazard ranking. So the location, the crossing location that is estimated to have the most crashes per year is the most hazardous and then they're ranked in descending order uh, from there. And this is the list again that is used by the PUCO and the ORDC to uh, generate that list of candidate locations for warning device projects. Now we do like to have uh, some kind of mathematical model because it does assist us in uh, prioritizing and identifying locations that are hazardous. However, and again this is to the credit of the Section 130 program implementation uh, both in the U.S. As, as well as here in Ohio, uh, that in general the locations that are the most hazardous have been addressed um, in previous years in terms of adding uh, warning, active warning devices at those locations. So now, uh, the problem being faced uh, by uh, the relevant agencies is that our candidate list, the crossings are very similar in terms of the crash prediction. So it, it may be difficult to identify which location from a group of many, potentially many hundreds of crossings, which uh, 30 to 40 we should use each year, uh, we should put into the diagnostic review process each year. So we have lots, many hundreds of crossings. How do we choose uh, a very, a relatively very small number uh, for the annual program? So again, obviously we do want to take our limited funding resources and use them at the locations where we consider to be the most hazardous and therefore the most in need of uh, being treated or being addressed with uh, warning devices. So the purpose of this project then is to essentially determine what other hazard ranking models are out there. Uh, and again, either in this case we would enhance the project development process by either confirming what is already done, uh, that it would be that it would be uh, consistent with good practices, or that there may be some other hazard ranking model that might provide a better uh, option for PUCO and ORDC to choose these crossings for the annual program. So again, basically what I just said, again, what are the uh, different hazard ranking models that we have available? Um, and uh, are they better than the current model that is used, the US DOT accident prediction model? So here's the research goal. Uh, that's the research goal, the objective. So we conduct a review of the formulas currently in use investigate current practices for hazard ranking in Ohio, uh, interview practitioners of certain formulas to determine how they, uh, how effective are they uh, in terms of practical use, uh, conduct, conduct a detailed evaluation of selected ranking formulas, and of course develop recommendations uh, to improve hazard ranking practices and uh, warning device project development here in Ohio. It's such a goal and objectives. Let's briefly discuss then our research approach. So we had three key elements. So the first one was a comprehensive literature review. So we identified methods used by state DOTs and in some states uh, other organizations for modeling grade crossing hazards and a warning device project prioritization. Now we were fortunate enough to obtain the annual program reports for the Section 130 program for each of the 50 states that we were able to review. These reports provided us with significant insight on how each state goes about developing its annual program of uh, warning device improvement projects and how those hazard rankings are calculated in each of those states. So basically answering the question, what are other states doing to identify 
hazardous crime. The second phase, the second element of our research approach was practitioner. Again, uh, we are looking at telephone interviews of state DOT or other agency staff, looking at all different factors related to both their project development process as a whole and specific operation of their hazard ranking formula. So again, answering the basic question, how are the different formulas working uh, for other states? Then the third part of our research approach was a detailed evaluation of selected models. Now when we dealt with our evaluation, we, we took a two-pronged approach. The first one was what I called an analytical evaluation. So basically calculate the model output using the existing Ohio inventory data and compare the different formulas. Then the second piece of the evaluation was what I called the functional evaluation. That is to say, if we have a really great model that does a lot of good things for predicting crashes, are we able to obtain the data that we need to operate that model uh, with the existing staff, with the existing resources that we have available to us in the ORDC and PUCO? So we have to bring both of those uh, elements into our detailed evaluation of the formulas that are out there. So again, answering the question, if we did have a better model, uh, could we actually use it here in Ohio with, with our current situation? Uh, so what we're seeing then is a nice uh, table here showing our uh, some of the current practices that we identified in the literature review. So 19 out of 50 states, 38 percent utilize the U.S. DOT accident prediction model. One of those states here is, of course, Ohio. Uh, 11 states had some kind of state-specific formula or method. Uh, 11 states had no formula mentioned. Uh, and then uh, the most frequently uh, listed uh, minor type of formula was a historical formula known as the New Hampshire Hazard Index, uh, which was used by 10% of the states. So what you'll see then is basically 78% uh, of the states utilize some kind of hazard ranking model or other systematic approach to uh, grade crossing project identification and prioritization. <coughs> Just looking at uh, some of the factors that are included in uh, grade crossing hazard ranking models. So train related variables such as the volume of trains, daytime volume, nighttime volume, train speed, the maximum speed of tracks are also considered in models. Now uh, crossing related variables such as existing warning device, number of highway lanes, highway AADT, and crash history are also commonly used. Now there's a couple of factors that aren't considered in Ohio but are considered in other states that uh, we will discuss uh, throughout this presentation uh, in terms of how they might be able to be applied in Ohio. So we have stopping site distance, which is currently used, uh, considered in nine states, uh, school bus or uh, special vehicle volumes uh, used in four states, highway traffic speed in five states, and the proximity of a rail crossing to a nearby intersection used in three states. So these are so if you think about how we might be able to improve the process here in Ohio, these four variables uh, are potential options in terms of adding new dimensions to our uh, evaluation process. And we also have the question of uh, what's called close call data, where a crash uh, is very close to occurring but thankfully does not occur, but you know, no police record or no crash record would be generated from an event like that. Uh, so there may be some hazardous crossings that have a lot of close calls, uh, but we have no real documentation to show that. So we did uh, look into that in a little more detail uh, with the states. A couple of other interesting findings. Uh, some states have conducted research projects similar to this one. Uh, a few states are using their results, and a few states, uh, for whatever reason, have not adopted their results. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, post facto evaluation of, of warning device projects is relatively limited. So looking back and saying, did we actually improve grade crossing safety at this location where we implemented the project, uh, even just rerunning the formula itself, relatively rare. Uh, and then a lot of, there's a, a little bit of trend toward the application of economic analysis, so your benefit cost, net present value, something like that. Uh, this analysis is desired but fairly limited again in practice. Um, there's some interesting findings there from our literature review. 
So we talked about also then our practitioner interviews. We interviewed uh, formula users at eight different state agencies, uh, seven DOTs, and then the California Public Utilities Commission, who is responsible for this function in the state of California. Our interview included questions about their safety program, project development process, and impl implementation of the hazard ranking formula in that particular agency. So again, our main purpose was dive in, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation with the actual practitioners of the formula to determine whether or not the formulas themselves uh, work well for their intended purpose. So a couple of different takeaways. Uh, states were generally satisfied with their formulas uh, and recognized very clearly and easily the limitations of the existing models that they use as well as the underlying data. The USDSC accident prediction model does have some web-based tools and that has resulted in increased access or increased usage of that model among states because they are able to easily access web-based data uh, that calculates the USDOT model uh, automatically. Now in terms of project development, uh, in all states in, this, in Ohio included in this case, the hazard ranking model is used to develop a, a quote, first cut of location by agency, agency staff professional judgment, as well as the diagnostic review results are always used in the final determination. So uh, the hazard ranking model results are not uh, the end of the process. They are just feedback into the next stage of the process. Uh, locations that are not highly ranked but are sensitive locations due to uh, political reasons or a recent crash or something like that, uh, even if they're not highly ranked, there's always state funds available for warning device projects. So every state we talk to had, and including in Ohio, is the same. In this case, there is funds available for uh, projects at locations that are not highly ranked, but we would desire to have a project there for various reasons. Uh, locations of a recent crash or uh, a direct application process where local highway agencies send in an application form are also used to identify candidate locations. Near mix data, now where it is available, are also used to identify candidate locations. Uh, but there are some concerns about consistency with the near miss data in terms of what constitutes a near miss, as well as consistency in reporting uh, among different railroads. Another key thing that we found in the interviews was that uh, the accuracy of the inventory database uh, for many different variables uh, was of concern. Uh, so, for example, and this happens a lot in other areas as well. We are generally lagging in terms of AADT and train counts. The train volumes can shift. Uh, AADT can change from year to year in, for example, fast-growing locations. Uh, and so then the inventory database updating lags a little bit on that. So there are locations that may have a lot more trains or a lot more AADT than the database uh, shows. And obviously those locations would have a little bit higher hazard, even though their ranking does not reflect that. But there was consensus among everyone that we interviewed uh, that the crossing inspectors and local data sources are used to uh, essentially confirm the inventory data. And also, uh, generally then, the inventory database does give us our best available data. So people recognize the restrictions on the database, but it still is the best available information for this decision process. In the case of Ohio, where we have more than 5,700 crossings, we have no, no choice but to uh, take it uh, at face value. Okay, so then the third part of the research approach was our detailed evaluation. Uh, and again, our analytical as well as functional evaluation. I'll discuss the results of both here in a moment. Uh, so we did look at uh, the USDOT accident prediction model, which is the model we currently use in Ohio, plus two variations. We also did a model with just exposure, so the cross product of AADT and train volume used to rank the crossings. We used the New Hampshire index, uh, NCHRP 50 model, and then four state-specific models, Florida, Missouri, North Carolina, and Texas, uh, specific models that we uh, evaluated in more detail. So our analytical evaluation essentially had two components. The first part was to establish is what, if, what, if any, type of relationship there is between the rankings we obtained from each of the models we looked at in comparison to the existing model in Ohio. So basically we asked the question, does any other model currently available produce similar rankings? 
is the existing model. One of the challenges that we face here in this process is that uh, the quote true uh, hazard ranking or the true hazard at each crossing is really unknown. We use the model to represent uh, the potential crash risk at each crossing. But not all factors that influence uh, grade crossing safety are able to be included in the model, or should they be actually included in the model? It makes it very difficult to incorporate every single aspect into the model, but we do the best we can. Uh, but lacking that information, the best thing that we can do is, is compare the other formulas to uh, the existing model. So this is the first part. The second part was, and we added this one in uh, after the results of the literature review, was to randomly select 20 crossings from the database. Uh, and we asked uh, the ORDC staff, and they graciously agreed to provide what I term the expert panel ranking. So basically taking the uh, data that is available about the cross, so the characteristics, train volume, uh, highway uh, information, things like that, without looking at the accident prediction value or the current hazard ranking, looking at aerial photos, looking at uh, street view photos, and then determine a hazard ranking based on the expert judgment. So it's desk review with the grade crossing inventory data as well as aerial imagery. So then uh, consensus uh, was obtained among uh, the staff that looked at uh, these 20 randomly selected crossings. Then we compared that ranking to the ranking that was obtained for these crossings using the different formulas. So again, in this case, our expert panel ranking provides our some kind of approximation of what we would call the true hazard ranking, right? So based on the expert judgment. So our question to be answered then: Does any hazard ranking model replicate the true hazard ranking? In this case, we're defining that by our expert panel ranking. So in both cases, we found that the existing model used in Ohio, that's the USDOT accident prediction model, was a, a favorable result and was superior to other models in terms of uh, identifying a hazard ranking. Uh, now another model that came close to North Carolina DOT investigative index also had a strong performance on the expert panel analysis, but it was just as good as the current model uh, when it came to that. So again, two different ways of looking at the problem, and in both cases what we find is that the current formula uh, was superior to the other model. The next part was a functional evaluation. So obviously, if you have uh, obviously all of the data that are, are needed to operate the USDOT formula are available in the existing inventory database because that's the formula we use in Ohio. So in our functional evaluation, we focused on how might we incorporate some additional variables into the decision process. And again, I focused on four different uh, variables or four different factors that uh, have been shown in other states to be helpful, somewhat helpful, for identifying great crossing hazard ranking. So the first factor is stopping site distance. So I look at the primary concerns here. Uh, stopping site distance, obviously, that is the ability of drivers to judge the presence of an oncoming train and to make an informed decision about whether or not to stop or if they can safely proceed through the crossing. Obviously, providing that site distance is essential especially in the case of passive crossings where we have a yield situation where the vehicle, uh, automobiles will have to yield to the train if they can see it. Now, site distance is currently considered in nine states and included specifically in three different formulas that we analyzed in this project. However, there's no site distance information specifically available in the current inventory database. Uh, additionally, uh, and we will talk more about this on the next slide, calculating site distance also requires highway traffic speed uh, which is uh, other concern. We'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. So it's difficult to measure consistently in the states that we talked to that utilize site distance agreed. It was difficult to measure consistently, difficult to keep the information updated, and the, the, the character, the nature of the site distance restriction, if it is present, particularly for uh, seasonal restrictions such as agriculture crops or uh, forests like foliage, uh, deciduous trees. Um, very difficult to measure that on a consistent basis to be used for uh, ranking, hazard ranking. Also, uh, you did note that
The third factor that uh, is considered then in five states and three different formulas analyzes highway traffic speed. So again, our primary concern here, higher speed reduces the time available by the, on the part of the driver to make a decision as they approach the grade crossing. So currently only 21% of the records in the inventory database have data for highway traffic speed. However, in other states have done this, we could utilize the state statutory speed limit in place of the actual speed limit if necessary. So that could be an assumption that we could make lacking information. Uh, and as I mentioned before, if uh, we want to incorporate site distance into the calculation, we would also need highway traffic speed as well. Now our crash analysis indicated that higher speed locations are not any more hazardous than lower speed locations. However, again, that was based on using the state statutory speed limit uh, for the remaining 79% of the inventory database. So it's, uh, it's unclear uh, if that relationship would be different if we had the actual speed limit in place in the database. Factor number four was the proximity of the rail crossing to the nearby highway intersection. To nearby highway intersection. So say a grade crossing on a roadway and the roadway uh, across than 150 feet of another intersection, another highway intersection. So our concern there is the complexity of incorporating the nearby intersection potential queuing from traffic control, uh, storage for longer vehicles in the case of some uh, very short storage areas, and then also uh, traffic signal preemption where signals are provided. Currently proximity is considered by three states and included on one of the formulas that we analyzed. Now we do have relatively complete data here with about 91% of records having some information about the proximity uh, of a nearby intersection and then the uh, number of feet if it is within 150 feet. Uh, so this could be incorporated into uh, a revised hazard ranking approach if necessary. So those are our main findings then uh, from our functional evaluation. So now we will dive into our recommendations here. So we have five different recommendations. Our first recommendation is to continue the use of the USDOT accident prediction model for grade crossing hazard ranking. Uh, and again, uh, based on our literature review, the USDOT model is the state of the practice, uh, it's defensible, as well as within our specific projects, the, that model performed the strongest on all of our evaluations. No other model is currently available. Uh, we provide on national averages and national data. Uh, so the only thing, uh, theoretically, the only type of state-specific Now, both of those models require information about stopping site distance uh, in order to actually operate the model. So one option could be uh, for stopping site distance information to be obtained as part of the diagnostic review process, then the hazard index values for each crossing being considered as part of the annual program could be calculated using the stopping site distance information obtained through the diagnostic process. Then we have what I call the secondary ranking, uh, which can be used to strengthen the decision-making process or at least provide a little bit more insight and more information. Now there may be a time in the future, for example, where the annual program here in Ohio could only fund a small portion of the crossings included in the diagnostic review process. This does actually happen in some states and more diagnostic reviews are scheduled than uh, there is funding available potentially for a project. So if you needed, uh, if Ohio or RDC needed to uh, somehow prioritize from the uh, initial pool of 40 crossings, to a smaller number of crossings. A secondary ranking uh, with the stopping site distance elements may be useful for that function. Currently that's not an issue because here in, in practice uh, ORDC only schedules diagnostic reviews at locations, uh, enough locations where uh, all of them could be funded if the diagnostic review came back uh, with a positive recommendation. Uh, so, uh, those are our recommendations for the hazard model. We also uh, got a lot of great insight from uh, the other states through our interviews on the warning device project development and uh, prioritization selection process. Uh, and so uh, my third recommendation from our uh, project then is to 
update the diagnostic review process to obtain better information about available site distance at a grade crossing. So right now we don't have this information available. Uh, but we're getting to the point where we have very similar passive crossings being considered as part of the annual program. One way we could prioritize is based on site distance, but that information is not currently available in the inventory database. So again, we start by adding fields to the database for our site distance measurements and taking those measurements in the diagnostic review process, maybe at some point incorporating that into the routine inspection of the grade crossings as well, and eventually we will have a database that is populated with information about site distance. What does that entail? That would entail the measurement of site distance along the roadway and noting the nature of any obstructions, permanent or seasonal. And of course, once we get that into the database, then we can go back and say what kind of relationships are there between seasonal site distance restrictions, permanent site distance, or open, no restrictions at each crossing, and how does that relate to safety? But right now, we can't make a really good conclusion about that uh, because the data do not exist at a very large level. But if we start now, uh, we may be able to uh, better choose between very similar passive crossing locations in future uh, rounds of project selection. So recommendation number four then uh, is provided here, uh, and that is the VORDC should consider uh, revising its project development process to consider including a larger number of crossings on the preliminary list of locations. And we say we're basically going to try and cast a, a bit of a wider net on the process right now. Uh, and one benefit to this could be that uh, if there are fast-growing locations where the AADC in the database uh, is substantially lower than the current AADC, or we've observed that uh, train activity has shifted across the state onto different lines, that information not uh, lagging in terms of database updating, uh, providing a little bit more flexibility in terms of identifying potential candidate locations would help us overcome some of these issues. For example, we could outreach to uh, county engineers to identify grade crossings in, in fast-growing areas, right, where the ADT in the database does not uh, reflect the current situation. So get the local knowledge. Uh, another opportunity, perhaps, would be to outreach to uh, railroad labor to identify near-miss locations that would not show up any other way uh, to try and identify hazardous locations. Or, outreach to school districts. So instead of trying to get information on school bus volumes, just ask the school districts if they have been experiencing, uh, if they go over a lot of passive crossings, or if there's a particular uh, one or two crossings where all of their school buses go over each day or something like that. So instead of getting the school bus volumes, just get suggestions on where we might be able to implement a project uh, that would have otherwise not shown up in the hazard ranking process. And again, the, the recommendation number four, the emphasis here is, can we be a little bit creative in terms of uh, identifying potential locations to overcome some of these database and modeling issues uh, related to the vintage or the age of the AADT data or the train count data. So again, our main objective is to identify hazardous grade crossing locations that are suitable for warning device improvement projects. How can we revise our process to better uh, obtain this information? Okay, and then finally, recommendation number five, uh, ORDC and PUCO uh, need to work together to develop some kind of written protocol or framework for grade, cross, grade crossing inventory database updates, as well as working with the ODOT Office of Technical Services uh, to see if their resource could be better used in identifying AADT. At a minimum, uh, locations where we have AADT values uh, near railroad grade crossings, uh, the numbers should be the same between ODOT technical services and uh, uh, highway railroad grade crossing inventory. So just sitting down and hammering out those issues would give us a good framework for uh, getting better data to feed into our uh, grade crossing hazard ranking model. And of course, routine review of the number of tracks, number of highway lanes, other factors like that. Now, if we look at recommendation number five, then, if we have greater confidence in our inventory data, 
we can uh, do some more advanced considerations. Uh, so we add in the site distance information. We're feeling more confident about the AADT data. Then we can look at a more comprehensive way at how do these factors influence grade crossing safety and grade crossing crashes in Ohio, possibly the development of a state-specific crash prediction model uh, in the future, but really it's not appropriate at this time given uh, the ongoing initiatives by both ORDC and PUCO to have the inventory database updated. And in fact, this, the uh, recommendation number five implementation is ongoing uh, in terms of being able to uh, have some of that synergy between the different organizations, making sure that we have consistent information across the different agencies uh, to support good decision making. And that's what really what it's all about. So implementation strategy, again, in the short term, uh, if a secondary hazard index is to be adopted, then some kind of spreadsheet tool uh, to assist ORDC staff in that regard. Uh, pilot test site distance uh, measurement during upcoming uh, field diagnostic reviews. So again, we're getting to this point where we have very small differences in the crash prediction value, uh, but locations that have a site distance problem uh, would probably be considered more hazardous uh, if you just think about uh, the rules of the road and the ability of the driver to yield to an oncoming train. So uh, is it feasible for us to incorporate site distance measurement into our diagnostic process? Uh, and then, as we just mentioned, looking at uh, ODOT, Office of Technical Services, to coordinate on traffic count issues. Several states that we talked to had uh, worked with their state DOT, uh, similar uh, technical services type division, to perhaps move the location of a routine traffic count to better serve both the, the annual or, or uh, routine measurement of AADT as well as provide uh, highway count information to the grade crossing database. So even just uh, looking at count locations could benefit uh, the grade crossing inventory. Now, of course, in the long term then, uh, devising the project development process to get feedback from different organizations on candidate grade crossing locations. Um, and again, this is something where uh, ORDC and PUCO are looking to the local agencies, looking to the people who have the most knowledge about grade crossing and uh, growth and development in their region to come up with that uh, initial candidate list. Written protocol for maintaining the inventory database, and then in the very long term, once we have those measures in place, then potential development of some kind of state-specific crash prediction model, um, either to replace or supplement the US DOT model. All right, so that's our um, that's our research results presentation. You see my contact information available, uh, or you can contact the ODOT research office. Uh, and our report will be posted online uh, in a few weeks. And if you have any more information, uh, any more questions, if you'd like more information, please don't hesitate to contact myself or the research office. Uh, we'll be happy to provide that uh, final report electronically to you. So with that, uh, that concludes the portion of the presentation. And I really do appreciate your time today and I uh, look forward to questions and discussion on this topic. Okay, I've opened the phone lines up. If anybody's on the line and they have a question, you should be able to um, speak through now. Okay, looks like we've got one. It says, regarding your safety project funded with Federal Section 130 safety funds, at what split do you fund your projects? We used to fund at 100% federal until FHWA mandated a max of 90%. So we're still doing 100%. Does that answer your whole question, Jason? Okay. Anybody else? On, on site distance, you, you recommended putting adding that element to it. Would it make any sense to also add, add the train, the uh, highway speed? 
to those things? I mean, was, that, was highway speed not a, a factor, a big enough factor in an accident to add that to it? Or if you're going to do the, if you're going to add sight distance, which requires a measurement, could you as easily add uh, highway posted speed, which should be readily available? Right. So uh, that's a great question. So in order to do the sight distance evaluation, uh, highway speed would have to be a part of that. Um, in terms of database implementation, highway speed is actually a field in the database right now. So uh, uh, without engaging database contractor to cluster of the database, so adding new fields. So it's already done. So that field is in there and about 21% complete in terms of actual measurement. So we could, as part of the site system, so you would uh, need to get we that. would have the speed anyway, so that would be added into the database and we wouldn't need any change. If you were going to put site distance into, I would, I would recommend putting in the highway speed, uh, populating that uh, more than it already is, making, uh, making sure that the annual or routine inspections get that information. Once we have that information, uh, and the fields may or may not be able to be added into the database for the other elements of site distance, uh, then we will have the highway speed available. Um, basically, the highway speed is probably the easiest part of that equation because the field is already in the database, and all you have to do is look around and find the field as the inspector. Thank you, Lou. So, along, sticking with the topic of site distance, um, ASHTED standards are something like that you're trying to see a vehicle height of, some, of three and a half as well, I think. What do these other states use for site distance for railroad crossing? Are they using train? Or are they using the surface of the tracks? Or is that that's significant? You know, that was something we really did not get into. And in fact, the, the whole issue of site distance uh, really evolved the project uh, as we started to interview the states that deal with it. We did not get into the weeds in terms of uh, how those calculations are performed. But I would imagine that, much like for the site distance on the roadway, that ASHTO has some kind of standard measurement height of the, of the driver uh, being able to see the, the approaching train. Um, there are formulas then that can be used to calculate the legs of the site distance triangle. Um, so assuming that you would not be able to change the speed of the train along the track. So based on, you know, basically the measurement is how far back from the crossing can you see a, a train at the distance along the tracks that you would need to be able to see in order to stop. And is the distance along the highway that you need to stop, is that actually accommodated at the location? Uh, but yeah, that would be something where you would have to um, decide on a standard approach to the measurement. Okay, um, we did have a clarification come in um, from Illinois again. It says, is that 100% still Section 130 funds? Um, they were told to use Section 130 funds at 90% or less. So I guess he's just clarifying that the 100% is still at one, the 130. Yeah. 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 Yes, it is still 100% of the 130, Jason. Can you hear that? Yep, he got it. Okay. So no other questions? Okay. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and we'll conclude everything. Um, again, as Ben said, you can email him questions or you can email him directly to the research office at research at dot.ohio.gov. Um, otherwise, this presentation will be posted on the research website hopefully by Friday. Um, and if you need anything, just give us a call. Thank you and have a good day.